31 years ago, in 1989, President Babangida was president, or General Babangida was president, and Udiko Iransom Kuti was health minister, and they enacted a national population policy 31 years ago, which promoted the idea that the average size, family size should be four children plus a father and a mother. What happened to that population policy? Today, I don't know whether, this week, I don't know whether you've read Tunji on Tuesday on the back of Daily Nation, or Abimbola Adilaku today, okay, okay. Uh, uh, in Punch, yeah. because I, you know, I'm sure they did not discuss, but they wrote about the same thing, about Honorable Dogua yeah. and his 27 children mm -hmm. and four wives. Mm -hmm. Yes? Now, four wives and 27 children gives you an average of about seven per woman. Right? At that level, and he's not an exception, it's not, yeah. by the way, Jigawa's, the Jigawa's average fertility per woman is 8.3. 8.3. And in the Northwest, it's about eight, just under 8.1. In the Northeast, is about 7.9. In Lagos, average fertility per woman and average size of family per woman is now 4.09. Now, what is the difference? In much of Lagos, many of those people will be one family of husband, wife, and child. In much of these other places, average fertility per woman is not average family size. So, when a man can marry four women with an average fertility of seven, mm -hmm. that gives you 28 children. At that family size, you cannot sustain an anti-corruption effort. It's just not possible because you cannot live up your legitimate livelihood and at the same time sustain those children and send them to school. That's the problem. So, we've got to start with responsible parenting and responsible family sizes. And government has a role in that. But right now, at some levels of dialogue, you see that some people think that population and poverty can be weaponized for purposes of achieving political control. That you can unleash, you can give birth to any number of children you want without looking after them. And every four years, weaponize them for the purposes of controlling power. And that is irresponsible because the first set of people, as we are discovering, who will be damaged by that are the same people who are organizing population and poverty. But it seems to me that at some level, to address your question, the leadership of northern Nigeria has got to open up about population science. That Emmer of Kano tried to do that and see what happened to him. Yes? But it's a very delicate conversation, but it has to be had. Now, why do I say it has to be had? Right now, that is Nigeria's biggest national security crisis. It's not Boko Haram, it's because that's today's issue. In 20 years, now Nigeria faces a perfect storm in about 20, 25 years. We would be about double our population. We will be the third largest country in the world after India and China. Oil will be a diminished source of revenue in the country because uh, it will have been replaced by our major buyers in the North America and in Europe. And therefore, the people who will be buying our oil at that point will not be needing much of it. Anyway, I cannot be paying a lot of money for it. Um, and so we will need different sources of money. And the biggest source of revenue at that point will be innovation and human skills and human capital, which means taxation. But we are not investing in our people now so that they'll be available to be taxed in 25 years. So that means per capita, the likelihood is that GDP is on a downward curve, while our population is a massive upward curve. Our population is growing at between 2.6 to 2.8% per annum. Our economy has flatlined at around 1% per annum. 
that means we have a crisis of demand and supply. We have more mouths than we can produce to feed them. Yes? That crisis of demand and supply is going to keep compounding. By the time we get to this threshold of 2040, 2045, everything is going to come to. Today, we've been borrowing, we've been running a recurring deficit for over five years. That means we've been borrowing to pay our overheads and borrowing all of our capital expenditure. We cannot improve our infrastructure, and we are barely 200,000. Where are we going to be when we are not building new schools? So we cannot absorb the numbers of kids coming through. And we are not training new teachers. All right? We cannot build new roads without debt that is prohibited. So the question is, how are we going to absorb, where is the elasticity to take all of these new kids who are going to come on board? We don't have it. That's the challenge. And if the leadership doesn't face up to this now, there will be nobody in 25 years to turn out the lights.